For Cremo Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Mali. Joining me today is journalist and violence researcher, Dr. Nahama Brody, here to discuss her book, Bomb Killings in South Africa. You stress at the start of your book that its focus is not only on the killing of white farmers, but rather on all those who have died of unnatural causes in farms where violence is suspected. You also note that these deaths make up a small number of annual murders. So what sparked the idea for this book, as I believe it was the most distressing content you've come across? All right, so let me just first get some definitions out the way, because these are important. The book is about farm killings, but that's not about all unnatural deaths. Um, My work studies mostly violent death, but I also study all sorts of other deaths that come through. And there is a distinction in terms of how we categorize deaths in South Africa. So a natural death is something that's caused by a heart attack, by an infection. Um, An unnatural death is a death caused by any other means. So it could be from a traffic accident. It could be from uh, falling off a ladder. um, It could be deliberate, you know, an overdose of, of pills, that sort of stuff. And it includes violent deaths as well. So deaths that are caused through the actions or the negligence of another person. And we have different legal categories that refer to those. So murder would be the intentional killing of somebody else. And culpable homicide would be the negligent or unintentional accidental killing of someone else. Um, And then there's a bunch of other legal subcategories that refer to things that maybe don't result in a death. And on farms, as in everywhere else, all of those types of deaths occur. So you have people dying of natural causes. You have people dying from being poisoned because they got exposed to a pesticide. You have people having accidents that, you know, falling off a tree, cutting themselves with a chainsaw. Lots of things happen on farms. But then there is also violence that happens between people. And that's the the type of uh, violence that I'm interested in is interpersonal violence. And when that results in a death on a farm, that's really what the book looks at. So it's not only looking at the types of deaths that we we clearly in the media um, regularly and easily categorize as murder, where you know there's a there's an attacker, there's a perpetrator, and there's a victim, and it's very very clear the roles are defined, um, and the the perpetrator kills the victim. And we understand that that is a a murder, or it seems to be a murder, even if it hasn't gone to court yet. But this book includes many other types of deaths that were not always categorized as murders um, that may have been considered as accidents or culpable homicides, um, or that weren't really categorized because they weren't pursued. And that would have included often sort of, let's say historically on farms, there were many accounts where a farmer would go out hunting, for example. And he'd be shooting at baboons on his property and then would accidentally realize, well, accidentally, I mean, according to reports, that he, one of the uh, things that he'd shot at actually was a child um, and he'd killed a child. Or there were stories from Johannesburg in the 1930s, I think, or maybe it was earlier, when Bez Valley actually used to be a massive farm. Um, which is quite strange for people who live in Joburg now. So a lot of the areas that we we know of as much more developed, maybe at one point were farmlands. Um, but there was an incident in Bears Valley where one of the farm managers there um, brandished a weapon at one of the farm laborers and didn't realize or says he didn't realize that the gun was loaded and just fired and then wound up shooting and killing the person. And it wasn't even tried as a murder case. You know, it was just deemed to be an accident in court. So the you know, the the laborer died, but the person who shot him and killed him was never charged with murder. And all of these types, are, you know, th- those are very clear sort of incidents of death. There's many other types of violence that happens between people on farms. And so this book really looks at, at a much wider spectrum of types of violence on farms rather than just sort of this classic idea of a farm murder. Now, in writing this book, you've gone back to farm killings from over a hundred years ago. Um, And you do state that farms began as places of violence. Can you briefly give our viewers some insights into that statement? This is an important concept for all of us who live in the global South. And a lot of people are uncomfortable with discussions around colonization and decolonization and what it means. But in terms of the historical record, it's really significant that we sort of observe Uh, the impact of the arrival of colonizing parties into areas in the global south. And what we see in South Africa is that when kind of colonizers arrived, that brings with it the advent of formal agriculture. So there were there were types of agriculture that existed before, but we wouldn't necessarily recognize them as the types of farmers that we understand to be farmers today. 
Um, and it's for a number of reasons. We didn't have necessarily the types of crops that were useful to propagate on mass. So what we had was kind of, um, you know, we had smaller herds and more sort of a migrant farming system. Although there was land ownership before the colonizers arrived, which is also something that many of us weren't taught at school. We were taught that everybody before Jan van Riebeck shared the land. And by the way, that's not true. So there was violence. And there was violence around resources before the arrival of the Dutch and later the English. But what we see with the arrival of the Dutch is a very specific and strategic approach to agriculture and more modern agriculture where the idea of this is my land and nobody else may use it is very firmly entrenched. And what happens is the Dutch arrive and as they start needing to grow the kind of um, crops, they're setting up a refreshment station at the Cape. What they do, and they, they do this throughout the country as they start to take over more and more land, is they take over the fresh water sources. And they basically say, this is now our water. And um, you don't have to even be a farmer to know that without water, you you can't, you know, you can't water your herds, you can't water your, your cattle, your sheep, your goats, whatever you have. And so this was the strategy of the Dutch initially, just in the, the kind of the area around Cape Town itself, was where they would take ownership of the water. And that would have that had a very, very negative impact on the other herders that were living in the area because it prevented them from being able to, you know, actually continue their, their livelihood in that way. But a second thing happened was as um, parties started to expand out of the out of kind of the Western Cape and into, you know, towards the Karoo and further towards later on what would be we would call the Eastern Cape. Um, in addition to taking ownership of the water in the same way, there were very deliberate strategies that were put in place by the early Trek Boers, who were farmers, so the, the word Boer meaning farmer, who would literally pull their belongings with them in a wagon. And as they would be sort of allocated land by the Dutch government, how they would go and take that land, how they would destroy the land, prevent access to water, also steal cattle. There's a lot of stock theft from indigenous populations that were living in those areas. And so the very formation of those lands is in inherently based in a lot of violence. And secondly, the way those lands were worked initially particularly in the Western Cape, was through slavery. And so, so we also don't really talk about that aspect of our history in South Africa that much because we tend to think it was very small. And, you know, slavery in America was terrible, but slavery in South Africa was somehow okay. And I've written a number of books that actually talk about this, and slavery was not nice anywhere, definitely wasn't nice in South Africa. So, so farming relied very much on slavery, which relied on oppressive tactics to keep slaves in check, because at one point, the slave population in the Western Cape outnumbered the burger population of, of settlers. And in order for them to sort of feel safe, they had to dominate through violence. And similarly, as people moved further and further away from Cape Town itself, um, they did also use indentured laborers from, you know, uh, local Quena and San or Bushman communities, often through very dodgy tactics. There was a, there were kind of practices in place where um, children, if children were found without parents, they could be taken into into a, a labor apprenticeship, and often that meant that um, burghers would just kill the parents and then take children, and so that it wouldn't technically be slavery, but it would be a, a very unnegotiated form of um, indentured labor. And so, and then this continues right up into, you know, from the time we get the fur trekkers moving into this land that wasn't empty, you know, so how do people come in and take land? So we have to understand that the foundations of the story are really rooted in a lot of violence and that this is the same story for agriculture, for formal agriculture in you know, South America, Latin America, in most of Africa, in large parts of sort of India, the subcontinent, a lot of those stories have to do with kind of violent means of owning and then retaining ownership of the land. So that's just the first chapter. I didn't want to get too bogged down in sort of old history, but it's really important that we acknowledge that it's it's never actually changed. And when you read some of the descriptions of how farmers, um, you know, oppressed their workers um, or killed their workers sometimes, killed their slaves. And then you read accounts from farmers doing the same things in the 1980s and the 1990s, you do see that there's a very strong through line to those practices. So I think it's very important that we acknowledge that as much as agriculture is obviously essential to our survival, um, and this isn't saying that every farmer is a bad person, but we have to understand that the roots of agriculture in South Africa are based in violence. And, and that set the stage 
um, for a story that would continue for for centuries and generations. Literally, you can read an account of a, a, a Swedish visitor to the Cape in the 1700s, and I could cut and paste his diary entry into 2000 and you know 2020, and you would think it was the same as a farmer being afraid to sleep in his bed at night in a farm now. So it's important that we acknowledge that and that this type of violence is not new in its existence. You know, maybe in its frequency, it's it's changed, but this is not a, a new thing. This is a very old thing. It's been with us for a long time. Now, you've mentioned uh, the media coverage on farm attacks. Uh, how have we gotten it right over the years and what are we still getting wrong? This is a bigger question. Um, so my research looks at trying is tries to look at all murders and how we cover them in media. I started off with a book on femicide, um, which came out two years ago, which was based on my doctoral research, which looked at South African media coverage of femicide. And so, for example, with femicide, I found that fewer than 20% of femicides that are committed each year ever get covered in the press which is quite, you know, surprises a lot of people. What we find with farm killings, so farm killings are much smaller in number, much smaller in number than femicides, um, but most of them get covered in the press if you combine all press things. So previous research that was done by Afri Forum, um, and they actually complained about it, it was quite funny. They said only, I think it was only 75% of farm murders get covered in the press. And I was like, you know, compared to other murders, this is a lot. And so what this creates through media coverage, and I think this is the one thing that we get wrong, but it's almost impossible to fix, is because so many farm murders get covered. Um, by the way, femicides are much more likely to get covered if they are a white woman who was killed on a farm. But because so many farm murders are covered and so few other murders are covered relative to their numbers, it can give the impression in media that there is a much larger number of farm murders because people don't know figures. They don't know that there are 2,800 femicides every year versus, you know, 200 or whatever the year is, farm killings every year. They just see the media coverage. And so they sort of think that everything must be sort of equal or proportionate, and it's not. So the way the media covers murders, first of all, gives us a false impression about the frequency of certain types of murders. We definitely underreport not only femicides, but definitely um, homicides. You know, the majority of victims of murder in this country are black men, and we don't see that in, in press coverage. So we have this skewed idea of murder. So I think that's one issue. Having said that, we live in such a high crime country that it is impossible. You know, I've worked as a journalist for the last quarter of a century, um, it's, it would be impossible, you, you know, as, as an editor, as a publisher, we could not cover every crime. We would have to put out a newspaper the size of a phone book every day to cover the crimes of that day and to follow up the crimes of the previous day and the previous week and all of those sorts of things. So logistically, we understand it's not possible. But, you know, having said that, I still think there are uh, areas where we could improve. What, 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 what we do also see is, and I was discussing this with someone the other day. With femicide, it's very interesting. Women are often blamed for their own deaths in the way the media covers it. So especially when it's like what the, what the media might call a love triangle or the result of um, infidelity or something like that, where, uh, or if a, let's say a woman's drinking, she's gone to a shabin or she's at a bar, somehow she's culpable uh, for the violence that follows because she she was doing something that she shouldn't have been. We don't see that in the coverage of um, the murders of white farmers in South Africa. This, you know, so they're very clearly um, positioned as, you know, they didn't deserve this. And so there's a lot of sympathy with them as victims. And I don't think that's inappropriate. I mean, I, I think it's appropriate for us to sympathize with victims. One of the key points I make in my book is that, when we look at uh, femicides and we say a woman didn't deserve to die like this, as a country, we really have to believe nobody deserves to die like this. Not even bad people don't deserve to die like this. And actually, we're not in a position to judge who is a bad person and who's a good person. We don't work like that. So there's a lot of empathy with white victims of farm attacks. 
um, which is important, but it's not balanced by similar empathy with other victims of other murders. There's a division between what we would call sort of a newspapers that focus more on a, an English speaking white audience, although their readers are not actually predominantly white anymore, but still like mainstream newspapers that are not traditionally black newspapers. Whereas when you read traditionally black newspapers, City Press, Sowetan, those tend to um, cover mostly uh, assaults and killings of farm workers and much less on farm owners. Whereas in the Afrikaans press, it's the opposite. And so if you only read one type of, of, of newspaper or you only read one language, you might also get a skewed impression. So there isn't a kind of an evenly distributed coverage. There's not equal sympathy or empathy for the victims. And um, media often tends to go for the easy rhetoric you know, the the sensationalism of the story uh, and wanting to find someone to blame rather than kind of delving into the community that's affected. So we get these very heightened peaks of media coverage, but there's no sort of sustained attempt to explain what's actually going on, you know, um, across the country. There's no real attempt to contextualize things, which makes us feel like we're in a movie where it's constantly the, you know, the climax and we're, we're constantly in the state of fear and, and um, you know, which is, I suppose, realistic. We are living in a horrible society with a lot of violence, but the media could do better at providing more information about what's going on. Now, you also write that if we want to reduce violence on farms, we need to look at the violence that surrounds farms. Can you briefly explain to our viewers what you mean by that? One of the ways um, that statistics are presented to us, so that the police present crime statistics, um, used to be annually, biannually, now it's kind of quarterly, um, is they they give us statistics for, for farm killings. And the definition of exactly what that means isn't always clear. Um, even in terms of the, you know, the security clusters definitions, the definition of what is a farm and who is a farmer has gone through a lot of changes over a number of years, and it's not equally applied all the time. You know, so, so in theory, now the security clusters definition involves all rural areas, but it's not clear how it's applied. Um, the challenge is the way that the media tends to understand farm killings reflects, I think, the popular understanding of farm killings, which is farm murder isn't a legal term. Right, it's not a legal definition. There's no crime category in the law called farm murder. If somebody gets killed on a farm, you know it's a murder or it's a culpable homicide. It can't be something else. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't tell us even whether it was rural or urban. It's just it's murder. Um, but the problem is the way the press reports on it. So we kind of know as a society that if something's called a farm murder, it's usually a white victim, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be on a farm but it's usually in a rural location. So we have a number of cases where people have been murdered on, for example, housing estates that are in semi-rural or rural areas. And those often get reported as farm attacks or farm killings by the press. The categorization in terms of police statistics also includes small holdings. So a small holding that is literally on the outskirts of Gauteng, which is surrounded by informal settlements, lots of other popular, you know, lots of other groups, whatever, is counted in the same way as a farm that's kind of in the middle of the Platteland. And they're really not the same spaces. So first of all, the definitions are not great. And there's not enough distinction between the definitions for us as readers or as audiences to make sense of them. But what it's produced over the last few decades, is this hyper-focus on what violence happens on a formal agricultural farm itself. Um, and and in technically, the small holdings that should be included in the crime statistics should only be small holdings that are dedicated to agriculture primarily. But again, it's not always evenly applied. The problem is, if we only look at what happens in that specific location, we're ignoring the fact that none of us exist in isolation. Um, and what, what uh, data shows consistently with farm attacks and farm murders is that the majority of perpetrators of these attacks come from relatively close by to the farming community, first of all. So they don't come usually, there's, there's sometimes claims that they're criminal masterminds coming from Joburg to the Free State, but those are a few and far between. The majority of perpetrators are fairly local. So they come from within driving distance, you know, easy driving distance to get to the location of the assault. And 
that's important because that tells us why our communities in those areas, why are they so prone to um, being open to commit violence against other people, right? Are they, you know, and so we need to study those communities. Um, in addition, we also need to see what is the profile of violence in the communities surrounding that farm. Because when I would say, so I call this a contiguous geography of violence. So instead of looking at one location in isolation, is if there's a farm and 25, 50 kilometers away, there's an informal settlement that is the primary feeder for labor in the area. And I would find in KwaZulu Natal, for example, there would be settlements that were near, very near to agricultural areas where they would often have, you know, four murders in a weekend, but it was a black informal settlement. And that would get almost no coverage compared to the murder of one white farmer in the same region, um, which would get tons of coverage. And I'm like, the two are related, right? These are close enough in terms of geography to, to be the same area. We cannot separate one from the other. And, and I think it's very important that if we really want a solution to the violence, we have to understand it better. And we have to stop looking at farms as exceptional places, as if they exist out of time or out of geography, out of place to everywhere else. It's, we are, we all exist linked to each other. And I think that inherently the police stations know this because they deal usually with the broader area. But it's not what we see when we get statistics. So, right, when we get statistics on farm murders um, from SAPs, they'll show you which provinces, but they won't tell you about which other murders are being committed in areas in there. So you get, again, a skewed perspective. So we really need to broaden our geography and not look nationally, by the way. I really think that farm murders, farm attacks have very strong regional profiles. So we should be looking closely at regional profiles of violence and murder in sort of, you know, 25, 50, 100 kilometer zones and try to see what that could tell us about the profile of violence um, and, and often poverty as well in that, in that specific area. Are you hoping this book contributes to information sharing in South Africa or even social cohesion? I think that the false stories about farm attacks and farm killings erode social cohesion. And that is why it is so critical um, to read this book and other work like this. I mean, there has been work, a lot of work done over many, many years. Um, and I think that when we as researchers try and tell farmers and right-wing lobbies and agricultural lobbies that they need to broaden their ambit and sort of recontextualize how they understand the crime. We're not dismissing the fact that these murders are happening. And my book really does make it very, very clear that the violence and the murders that happen and that are committed against white farmers also on farms are horrific and they're unacceptable. But if we refuse to understand them correctly, what it does is the way the narrative is put forward now is it increases mistrust between communities. So instead of building social cohesion at a local level between, say, farmers and the local community, it entrenches the division, which means it's much harder to find a solution. The only potential future solutions to violence in South Africa are going to come through improving social cohesion, improving social support, improving ideas of community. We are not going to do it in isolation. There is no solution to violence in this country that only serves white people. It's really important to understand that. So the problem is I know that the people who have a very strongly entrenched idea of what and why and how farm violence happens are not going to even read this book. And this book really wasn't written for them because I know that I have been working in this area for a number of years. Um, it would be wonderful to think that simply good information would have the strength to change somebody else's mind. I worked as a fact checker for many years, and we do know that it's simp it's not a war of facts. It is be it becomes a war of emotion, feeling, and belief. And again, that is a further obstacle to creating this cohesion that we so desperately need. And you know, the only thing I could hope for is how do we as South Africans start seeing each other as human? What we see very clearly through the practice of violence is that there are still many white farmers and white farm owners and the majority of large agricultural land and operations in South Africa are owned by whites still. We know that the sort of the hierarchies that exist in agricultural areas are still problematic. Um, we know that in many towns and in farming areas, black laborers are still treated incredibly poorly even though we are in 2022, not 1922. We know on the other side also that when 
farm attacks happen or assaults happen against white farmers is that the perpetrators of those attacks do demonstrate utter, you know, apathy, like apathy, dislike, callousness towards the victims. Um, and I must say, this is also comes through in my book, though, it's not unique to farm attacks, right? We do know that perpetrators of this type of violence generally for me as a violence researcher, it's almost like they've completely disconnected from their humanity in order to commit this type of violence. How do we reconnect people to humanity? You know, it's not going to be through buying more guns. It's also not going to be through sitting around and having drumming circles and singing Kumbaya. It's going to take, you know, much, much more concerted work and an effort from politicians to start really trying to deal with the problems that as they exist, instead of politicians as they currently do now, simply, it seems to me like politicians almost love farm killings because it's a chance for them to climb on a soapbox and get attention. And I have not seen anything from the ANC, the EFF, the Freedom Front, the DA. I've really not seen anything that speaks to an actual solution to the problem all I see repeatedly is politicians using each of these absolutely horrifying, bloody, devastating, traumatic incidents. The politicians use them all to gain media points um, and to further polarize the electorate in, in a search for votes, which I think is just appalling. It's disgusting. There was journalist and violence researcher Dr. Nehama Brody speaking to Polity about her book, Farm Killings in South Africa.